So, Sean's session was an excellent lead for my session. I was not aware that that is how it was arranged or was it sheer coincidence, but whatever it was it worked very well. Hi, sorry about that. So, that was an interesting technological conflict that I never had experienced before. Uh, so, what what I am going to talk about is uh, is about Toyota Kata today and a lot of what I am talking going to talk about today is taken directly from uh, Mike Rother's book on Toyota Kata. There is no I am I'm not a great inventor myself, but what I hope to do is to actually make a connection between the principles of Toyota Kata with. So, uh, so what I thought was I'm, go I'm going to try and make the connection between what how to, what Toyota Kata is all about and how it connects with lean Kanban thinking and how the Kanban method from David Anderson helps you actually put a, 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 a Toyota Kata culture working practice in your own teams. So, that's the that's the theme of the topic today that I'm going to talk about. So, let's set uh, a quick introduction to myself uh, without wasting uh, any more time. Uh, I, I, I do work for Digite, I, I head our implementation teams and on a part time basis I do lean agile consulting, I do run the limited web societies in India. So, let us set the context and uh, I think you know with with the with the plethora of all the tools, methodology, frameworks, there are over 30, 35 scale frameworks today in the marketplace. The question remains whether management teams are fundamentally, ha fundamentally happy with the outcome that they have seen with the agile journey of the last 20, 25 years. I do not know what is the feedback that you all hear, but in most cases the, the feedback that I hear from the senior execs that I talk to is that they, they believe it is just a passing fad and it will go away, there will be another, another something in the next 10 years. So, very clearly they have not seen the benefits, they have not seen any long term sustainable benefits, nothing significant that would definitely challenge their core principles and experiences from where they started their own journeys. So, the f fact is that despite so much of research about Toyota and Toyota's perhaps one of the most open, open organizations sharing its best practices, sharing their whatever they have, whatever methods and tools and techniques that they have adopted, there really has not been a se second Toyota including, including Japan. The success of Toyota is absolutely unparalleled across the industry, across the manufacturing industry leave aside the software industry even within the Japanese companies. So, there is something in their recipe that clicks more than just you know doing a judoka or doing a kaizen or doing a doing doing whatever they are doing. There is something in that sauce that pe people are missing. And one of the quotes that I uh, that Mike Rother uh, picked up was that Toyota deeply values continuous improvement as their key value. They do not have a goal of that hey we want to be from 10 billion to 50 billion in the next 10 years, that is not their objective. They do not want, they do not have any goal of I want to become the number 1 and or 2 in all the market segments that we are in. That is very typically the company goals and, and objectives that I have seen uh, at the CXO level, but that is not what their objectives stated objectives are. They are very clearly focused that how do I make a continuous improvement culture within the organization sustain at a very grassroots level and that is where our focus is going to be today. Unfortunately, we are not the best copycats. Time and again wherever I have landed up uh, in a consulting engagement, the first question that I get asked is ok, so what template? How do I do my requirements? Give me a template for my status reporting, right? And if you tell them that you know I do not have any template to start with, I do not know what you are going to what do you do? I do not know what your challenges are. We will figure it out. They possibly see it oh my god I got a consultant who is now going to figure out on my dime that what I need to do, right? So, it is it, it's looked negatively if you do not come, come to them with a set of templates and manuals saying step 1, step 2, step 3, step 2 dot 1, step 2 dot 2, step 2 dot 3. And I think clearly speaking they miss the point. So, we land up copying what is visible, what are the practices and principles we land up copying, but we miss the thinking behind that, right? Toyota did not start Gemba just from day one out of nowhere. They did not start an, with an A3 template just out of nowhere. It came out of a sustained journey of trying to figure out what is working, what is not working and therefore, why 
one pager that fits in A3 is better suited than 10 to-do checklists, right? So for us to, to quickly imbibe and say, okay, here's the A3 template, let me use the A3 template for a retrospective. But that was not the objective or what it was meant for. So I think time and again, we make this mistake of trying too soon to jump into copying templates. And pardon my saying this, but unfortunately, a lot of the new frameworks and the and the, and the methods are again becoming very template oriented. Do this, this is your first step. This, is will, uh, this will be your road to success. So continuous improvement essentially means that if you are at point X today, and if you have a vision of where you want to be tomorrow, what are the small incremental steps that I need to make along the way knowing very well that, that there is no direct path to go from where I am today to where I want to be. So it is going to be a continuous journey. It is going to be an adaptive journey. It is going to be a learning journey. And it is going to be a small incremental steps. It will not be a massive six, a massive six month campaign and then that's it. The story ends, I've reached my destination and then again after six months I'll do another campaign to go from X level of productivity to Y level of productivity. So it's a continuous process. It's not something that I would do in batches, in steps, right? Relying on periodic retrospectives, you know, whether it's two weeks, four weeks, but relying on retrospectives assumes that the system is static. The same kind of problems that happened a month back, based on a given certain uh, data and a situation, I'm going to do a Pareto analysis on that today and try and figure out those two, three things that I'm going to try and fix. But the system has changed. Just switch off that light. That light is too strong. If you can switch off the light, that person has disappeared. OK. So kata means a routine. So, so just as a small, uh, just as a small, I'm about to finish actually in time. Just as a small uh, side, uh, just cross your hands. Just cross your hands. Try, try just crossing your hands. OK, bring it back. Do it again. Bring it back. Do it the third time round. Did you do it any other way? Did the, did the order of the hands change? Think about it. No, right? So the brain has been conditioned to doing, responding to a stimuli or to a request that whenever you are told to do something, you will do it in that order. When you're in a traffic and a person suddenly comes in front of you, you don't think and then respond to that situation. You're conditioned to press the brake. So the trick is, can I reach a state where continuous improvement is a routine? It is not a practice to be told and cajoled and pushed for and planned and incentivized and blah, blah, blah. Can I make continuous improvement a routine? Because if you can, then really speaking, there is no end to that journey. So two, two key things. One is the improvement kata, which we'll talk about. The second is coaching kata, which we'll not talk about today, it's surely because of time. And if you don't mind, I will eat into the 10 minutes break that we had on the schedule. Is that OK? Thank you. So we'll talk about improvement kata and continue with that and focus only on that one aspect today. So very clearly, uh, even in, in Kanban system and lean thinking, where we focus on value stream, we're typically focusing on handoffs from one, one stage of the value addition to another stage of the value addition. There is very little work in that literature that is happening within that process itself. So if I'm doing coding and, and, and coding is a stage, I'm talking about how to improve the code, uh, cadence of the code, coding process, what are the constraints, what are the bottlenecks. But that's where my focus is, is, is how to improve cadence, how to make sure bottlenecks are taken off, things of that nature. What we are trying to look at is just within that process itself. So the key thing that we first start by doing, the first step, is to first define a vision for the team, right? Uh, Alvin Toffler says you have to, you've got to think about big things while you're doing small things so that the small things all go in the right direction. Another classic problem of retrospectives that you'll see is that different people are doing different things. You'll have, because you've done a Pareto and you've got a feedback, there are two quality items, there are two items from HR, there are two items from the delivery team, it's all over the place. 
what we want to do is we want to say that give a vision so that at least the line items that you want to work for in your continuous improvement, they have some background and some context saying, yes, it will help me in this vision. So the first step, define a vision. The second step that now that you have a vision, you know that you're not going to be able to go there immediately. So use that vision to define your next steps. And you know for sure that you will go through the next steps facing obstacles. There will be technological obstacles, there'll be change management obstacles, there'll be risk uh, obstacles, there'll be obstacles from senior ex executives. All the way you will get obstacles. So you will have to figure a way out to go from that small step today to the next step, working around with those obstacles. And last but not the least, this I think is the most important thing specifically for the software uh, people that we are in, is try to build a pattern in your project execution. Nine out of 10 times, my own project teams, we are responding to fire all the time. You have certain set of planned items, you're already planned for 99%, if not 110% utilization. For sure, the good guys who are the team leads are planned for 125% utilization. On top of that, there will be a request to do an RFP analysis. There'll be a request for do a critical fix from a previous project. That's the ground reality. So you're working in an extremely ad hoc, unplanned manner. And if you're working in that environment where there is no predictability, you will not be able to assess that if I introduce a change, what is the outcome of the change? So then we are again back to the model where we take five points of improvement, imp apply them all at the same time. We may or get some, may get some better results, may not. But for sure we can't quantify and saying, or we can't point and saying, this one worked, this one did not work. Or if this one did not work, why it did not work? Because I changed five things all at the same time. So, the Kahneman method helps in continuous improvement. And the key thing that I realized as I've been introducing Kanban is that by introducing WIP limits, and I'm assuming people are familiar with the Kanban system, is that by introducing WIP limits at the different stages and ensuring, and put, why are we doing that? At the end of the day, a Kanban system's objective is to introduce, introduce uniform cadence. We want the, the rate of throughput of a testing stage to be the same as the throughput from the development stage, to be the same rate of throughput from the design stage. So by having a uniform cadence, I now have a controlled system in place. I have a pattern of work method that I can every day work to. If tomorrow suddenly five more line items come, come on my plate, I am controlled by the WIP limit to say, no, I will not do this because my WIP limits will get exceeded. So beyond all the benefits of flow and pull based execution, which are ultimately all ob objective is to build in uniform cadence, that uniform cadence helps you to build and establish a pattern in your work. And now if you've got a pattern in your work, you can actually go ahead and implement changes. So you can do, so what do you do? Once you have a system where you have some regularity and you have a rhythm of work, now you can introduce what Theoda calls as single factor experiments. So like Sean said, they're extremely fast changes. They do these changes at, at, at rates of 15 minutes. They're they are not like long planned change management initiatives. They're as short as 15 minutes, 30 minutes, rarely going to something uh, of, of, of long duration. But the fact is they're single factor experiments so that they know that if I Introduce this, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, I can take it back, right? I know what was the cause, I know what was the effect. So they do, so you establish a work, you establish a work pattern, and then you do single factor experiments to continuously improve. And this is obviously the very standard uh, PDCA uh, picture that everyone might have looked at. The basic point is that you keep doing PDCA and you then define standards so that your maturity of the team doesn't come down. So you kind of keep improving the standard on a continuous basis. You keep doing PDCA with these small single factor experiments so that continuous improvement becomes a rhythm, it becomes a routine in the team. <coughs> in summary, what, what, what do we want to do in improvement Carter? We want to define the target condition or the pattern. We want to define where we are today. Uh, what are the obstacles? 
which ones are you addressing in this step today when you're going from step one to step two? Uh, what is the next step? And obviously, if you have done a single factor experiment, then you, at the end of it, you'll be able to figure out which one worked, why it didn't work, what was the factors that caused it to fail. Right? Let's recap, define a vision, identify the next step, use something that establishes a work pattern. That's where I have found Kanban system to be extremely helpful, the Kanban method to be extremely helpful. And do quick PDCAs with single factor experiments. Don't try to do large retrospectives, definitely not after three months in, you know, in, in, in terms of when your overall release is all done and dusted with. That's all I had to share. Sorry for the, in, uh, for, for eating into your tea time today. But uh, if you have any questions, the one question, I think that's all I can take before, otherwise I'll start eating into the next speaker. So single factor experiment means that at one point of time in any control system, you change one element. That's all. So you change one element, give it some time to see whether that change has introduced the, the intended consequence or not. So that's where Sean's point is. If the, the team becomes conditioned to do it, that they will do it themselves once they see there is a problem. Right? So, so team A does it within their team. Team B has a different problem, he does it within their team. So the nice thing about these things is that that because they're single factor experiments of small scope, small impact, in one shot they're never very rarely of a mega impact reaching the whole uh, thing, right? But they incrementally keep adding value and because you're doing them fast, the change is continuously happening fast, okay? So there lies the difference there. And of course, if something is very high impact, you will, uh, you will go to the next levels and, and, and they will be in the picture. The coaching carta talks about how to actually make people train to do this, but read Mike Rother's book and that will cover, explain it. Anything else? Thank you guys.